So uh, without further ado, I'd like to ask David to, to kick off and tell us about Brewing Delta. Thank you, Guy. I'll just share my screen and hopefully this works through swiftly. Uh, thank you very much and thanks to you all for, for joining us too. Uh, over the course of the next 15 minutes or so, uh, James and I will run through some of the key tax considerations uh, in planning as to how grandparents are able to assist in the payment of school fees. Uh, we've made assumptions that they, like many of our clients, uh, typically have certain forms of investment, uh, capital and, and savings on which they can draw for this purpose. Uh, this is very much a summary of how they're able to provide um, tax efficient use of that, of that income and capital for, for this purpose. Uh, and the next webinar, which is planned for September, is more of a deep dive, so to speak, in, in how you might consider structuring future savings plans and so on uh, for school fees planning. And more details of that will follow in due course. Uh, you'll also receive a follow-up email with an invitation to that webinar uh, with some literature from uh, today, which will relate to today's topic. As I already mentioned, this is more of a headline summary. And uh, as, as Guy mentioned, we can cover off uh, some specific queries in, in the Q&A uh, or under separate cover uh, after the event. Um, by way of quick introduction, uh, despite our appearances in the photos, Jamie and I have between 40 years of, of financial planning experience, uh, and I can leave you to determine on the basis of our looks, who, who's got more or whether that's split equally. Um, please be kind. Um, by way of company, uh, Bruins was established in 1762. Uh, we're one of the largest independently owned uh, investment managers in the UK. We have over 42 billion pounds of monies under management, 32 offices across the UK and the Channel Islands, and have a very long history of working in partnership with our clients and their families and professional advisors to achieve financial planning solutions uh, in a way which is as unique as each of our clients' needs. Um, we've split the key considerations into seven areas of, of planning in this topic, uh, where grandparents and other family members can and, and want to assist in the uh, payment of school fees. Uh, without further ado, I shall hand over to James to run you through those before we hear from, from David, uh, and then we'll move on to the Q&A under Guy's trusty stewardship. Jamie, over to you. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really looking at today the, these seven areas are, are, are where grandparents can, can help the, uh, the grandchildren's school fees, but also gain some inheritance tax savings as well, which indirectly um, reduces the cost of the school fees. Um, the, 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 the first one to look at, I think, is, is gifts out of income. This is a little used exemption. And essentially, where you can demonstrate that you have surplus income and you can give it away regularly, uh, it's immediately exempt from inheritance tax. Uh, there are some conditions, first one being it must be from income. You can't give all your income away and then rely on your capital to pay your living expenses. That's not allowed. That would be deemed a gift of capital. Um, so the first consideration, it has to be from income. Um, has to be regularly paid. Now, that could be monthly, quarterly, annually. Um, it doesn't matter which frequency it's paid in, but it has to be regular. And as I sort of alluded to in the first point, if it, it, the, the gift can't affect your standard of living. So um, it must be that once you've made your surplus income gift, you still have sufficient income to, to maintain a good standard of living. And uh, there's a couple of things to be really important about making gifts out of income. And that's it's really important to document the gifts. And there is actually a, a, a form that HMRC have in their um, probate form actually, which is IHT 403 which is a really useful form that can allow you to note down all the gifts. And essentially it's, it's, it's the duty of your executors um, to, to demonstrate the gifts that you've made in the past. And I think that's a really, really good, um, a good way of, of, of demonstrating that. So it's a little used allowance, but a really, really effective one because the income that you give away is immediately exempt. Um, next we come on to um, gifts out of capital. Now everybody has, uh, an annual allowance of £3,000. They can give £3,000 away and it's immediately exempt from inheritance tax. So couples can give away £6,000 between them. There's also a small gift exemption, which is £250, which you can give to anyone, but you can't give £250 to someone who's benefited from £3,000. That's, that's not allowed. And grandparents can make gifts in consideration of marriage, um, which um, are for £5,000. So... Um, using gifts out of surplus income and the allowances that I've just described um, can get quite a lot of money out, out of one's estate each year. And um, whether it be for school fees or, or any other uh, issue, um, using these gifts is really, really important. And it's really the starting point, I think, for making gifts 
um, to save inheritance tax. Um, we then come on to larger gifts. Now, I've already, already described the, the annual exemption of £3,000, the small gifts of 250 and the marriage gift of 5000 Any gifts on top of that are potentially subject to inheritance tax, and they're called potentially exempt transfers. Um, you'll see in the, in, in the subheading there, limits and rules. Well, there are no limits, actually. You can give cash to an individual. You can give as much as you like. There's no restraint on that. Um, but the rules are you need to survive for seven years um, from the date of making the gift um, for it to fall out of account for inheritance tax purposes. Many people talk about a tapering amount of tax on a gift, which is right, but taper relief is, is the relief on the tax on a gift and not the gift itself. So if you're making a gift that forms part of the nil rate band, there's no tax to pay, so there's no taper relief. So it's only large gifts in excess of 325 thousand pounds that benefit from taper relief um gifts of capital to children and grandchildren are, are are very straightforward again it's important to document that the gifts have been made and it's probably sensible for the recipient to acknowledge the gift in writing so there's a record of the gift being made now we move on to a, a more complex area um, of gifting which is gifts to to trusts and um uh which essentially come in two parts. You can make a gift to a discretionary trust, which gives the trustees lots of, of discretion on who gets um, capital. They decide when they get it and how much is given and who gets it. Um, in in revenue, put a limit on how much you can put into a trust where there is complete flexibility. It's £325,000, and that must include any gifts that have been made in the previous seven years to discretionary trusts. If you exceed £325,000, there's an immediate tax charge of 20% on the surplus above £325,000. But again, couples can give away £650,000 between them. Um, the seven-year rule applies, again, in the, in the estate for seven years. Money can be distributed from the trust within seven years. That's, that, that's not an issue. But for inheritance tax purposes, the, the, the gift is inside the estate for seven years. Um, I won't go into too much detail on, on this because it's very, very complex and it might come up in the questions later. But if you're making cash gifts and gifts to discretionary trusts, have to be very careful on the order at which you make them because you can, you can fall into a, a, an unnecessary tax trap if you get it wrong. Um, it's not overly complicated. You just need to understand the order in which the gifts are made. You must seek advice on that from a solicitor or, or from a firm like us and, 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 and get that right. Because you can easily avoid unnecessary tax if you, if you, if you just take some advice on that. Um, when the money's in a discretionary trust, how do, you, how do you get the money out? Well, um, most discretionary trusts will use something called an offshore bond, which will allow the capital and the income produced in the trust to grow tax efficiently. And there are ways in which money can be withdrawn from the discretionary trust efficiently. Um, you, some of you may have heard of a 5% withdrawal facility, which is something that allows you to withdraw 5% of your initial investment um, at any, at any time without any immediate tax. It might be taxed down the line, but you don't suffer any immediate tax. And that 5% withdrawal facility is cumulative. So if you haven't used it, it builds up and you can therefore withdraw quite a lot of capital that way. Um, again, um, it's a very, very um, complex area. So you need advice on this. One of the other options is, is most offshore bonds are assigned, have segments, many, many, many segments. And grandparents who are usually trustees can assign segments to their grandchildren via a bear trust. Um, and that allows the grandchildren to utilize their personal allowance, their personal savings allowance, and their savings allowance, which all adds up to 18 and a half thousand pounds, which means that if you have several grandchildren and enough money in a trust, you can get quite a lot of money out every year, completely tax free. So that means that you can put money in with no immediate tax charge, Capital and income can grow tax-free in the, in the trust whilst it's growing, and you can get money out the other end tax-free in certain circumstances. The conditions have to be met to achieve that. But again, go to, go to a firm that understand these things, um, and you'll, you'll get the right advice on that. The final point um, I'm going to make is, is loans to parents. Um, uh, grandparents can make loans to their children, um, and they can charge a, a, a commercial rate of interest if they wish. They can. They could, you know, make it interest free. It's entirely up to them. It depends on what circumstances they're in and what, what, how far they're prepared to go. 
Um, again, it's really important to, to document these, um, the, these loans or gifts to make sure that it's very, very clear whether it's a gift or a loan, because there can be implications on, on whichever route you take. Um, and it just makes sense to have, you know, have everything documented, dated and very, very clear so that everybody understands when looking back, perhaps the executor looking back at the estate can fully understand what's gone on and recall loans if, if a loan's been made or identify a gift if the gift's been made and at what date and so on. So um, that's, that's about it for me for the moment. Um, and I think we're now passing on to, um, to, to, to David Forsdyke of, of Knight Frank. Thank you very much, James, uh, for an excellent presentation. I've, I've scribbled a couple of notes myself there, so uh, some useful learning points. I too am just going to share my screen. Uh, so you should now see our uh, title screen, equity release and school fees. Um, I should start by just uh, introducing Knight Frank Finance to you. Uh, Knight Frank Finance are part of the wider Knight Frank family. Um, most of you will be familiar, I think, with the Knight Frank name. Uh, we are uh, uh, an estate agency and property related uh, company. In fact, anything to do with property, Knight Frank are involved in it in some capacity. Uh, and obviously Knight Frank Finance complements that extremely well. Uh, we are a, a completely independent uh, advisory service providing advice on home finance right across the board. Um, I head up a team uh, known as the Later Life Finance Team, uh, and we are a team of experts that uh, deal with products tailored for older homeowners. Um, so I was delighted when uh, I was asked to speak at this particular presentation about equity release and school fees because we're talking about how grandparents might be able to help. Uh, and most of the clients I deal with are grandparents, so it fits in very nicely. Um, let's start though by talking about what uh, is equity release. Um, equity release has uh, had a bit of a roller coaster after the, over the last 20 years. Uh, but the modern equity release product range is available to homeowners in the UK. It's available to anyone above the age of 55. Um, it is typically done under what's known as a lifetime mortgage. As the name suggests, it's a mortgage secured against your property. Uh, what makes it slightly different is that it lasts for the rest of your lifetime. So the mortgage stays with you um, uh, for the rest of your life or until you move out of your property into care. Um, lifetime mortgages can be taken as a lump sum, uh, but they can also be set up with what we call a drawdown facility. Um, and the interest that's charged under the mortgage um, is normally rolled up on top of the debt. In America, they actually call it a reverse mortgage, which kind of makes sense because the debt is gradually getting bigger. Um, but you can choose to pay that interest if you wish. Uh, and for a lot of our clients, that's quite relevant if they've got disposable income to service the interest. That means their debt is not getting any bigger. Um, there are a set of standards um, by the Equity Release Council. That's the trade body that governs this market. And the products are very heavily regulated by the FCA. We all have to be authorised and, and hold a certain qualification to give advice. So that's just a brief introduction. Um, in the school fees planning um, arena, um, this is a really interesting one. And it's, it's one where for us, a lot of our clients who are what you might call asset rich, but cash poor, have looked to the, the wealth tied up in their property to help them. Um, and I've got three examples here to talk to you about three slightly different examples in the, the school fees arena. Um, the first example, we've got a couple aged uh, 75 with a property worth 800,000. Um, and they're in good shape financially themselves, they're comfortable, uh, but they would like to see their granddaughter through uh, private schooling at a cost of 15,000 pounds per year. Now, um, what they could do is use the wealth tied up in their property to release initially 15,000 pounds to cover the first year of fees, but also then have a drawdown facility available to them of 200,000 pounds, which would be more than enough to cover the, the subsequent seven or so years for the granddaughter. Um, 
So that's a very cost effective way of doing it, borrowing a small amount initially and then small drawdowns going forwards. Um, the second example is uh, more at the sort of high net worth end of the market. Um, we've got a gentleman aged 82 with a property worth 4 million, um, and he is worried about inheritance tax. Uh, as James was saying earlier, there are things that can be done to reduce the potential impact of inheritance tax, but what do you do if it's all tied up in your property? Well, this particular client has uh, three grandsons at boarding school, um, each uh, costing £45,000 per year. And he would also like to contribute towards their university fees once they get through school. So in this scenario, uh, a solution was to set up a lifetime mortgage and just take a lump sum of a million pounds. And that lump sum was put into a trust structure. Uh, and as James was saying earlier, the, the trust structure itself will depend on the client's circumstances, whether there are any other gifts that have been given away in the preceding seven years and so on. Uh, we don't get involved in advice on the trust itself. That's where I would hand over to, to James and the other experts to uh, advise on where and how that trust is structured. Uh, but what we can do is set up the lifetime mortgage in the first place. My third example is uh, a couple aged 65. Um, they are still working. They still have a small mortgage on their main residence and uh, that mortgage carries some early repayment charges. So they're reluctant to do anything with their main home, but they do own uh, a second home, uh, which is worth around 300,000. Um, and they would like to make a contribution to their children towards their grandchildren's um, school fees. And in this case, what they were able to do is raise uh, a lifetime mortgage secured against their second home rather than their main residence, uh, raise a lump sum and make that as a gift as James said, that was probably as a potentially exempt transfer, but make a gift of £60,000 to their children. So there's a few scenarios there for, for you to consider. Um, I've included our contact details on the slide here, and I know these will be available after the presentation. Um, but uh, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. If you'd like to stop sharing, that's great. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now is move to uh, a Q and A, and uh, and we'll throw questions around. Uh, well, we'll 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 look at the questions to see who's best uh, to answer them. Uh, so I'm going to uh, try and lump questions together as much as I can. So uh, Shahira Kazam asked, uh, "My mother would like to gift twenty thousand pounds towards her grandchildren's education." And how best should she or we invest or use this? Uh, and we had a question in advance that was quite similar about uh, a, a couple who've got cash in hand but are not sure about the inheritance implications of gifts. I think I'll take that one, Guy, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yes, this, this is the starting point of my presentation, really, on, on making use of all of the various gift allowances that, that are available. Um, it, it might be possible, depending on the circumstances, to get most of that money out of the estate um, tax-free, inheritance tax-free. And the way you would do that is, is you've got the annual exemption. Um, couples have got annual exemptions, which is £6,000 between them. Um, but you can also use last year's annual exemption as well, if you haven't used it. So essentially, it might be possible to remove 12000 of the £20,000 from inheritance tax immediately. And if, if gifts were going to be made early in the, the new year, say in February or March, you've only got a month or so before you've got a new tax year when another £6,000 can be um, gifted exempt from inheritance tax. So as you can see, you, you can use effectively three years worth of allowances if last year's wasn't used and you're quite close to the new tax year to get the majority of that money outside of the estate um, for inheritance tax purposes. In terms of investing it, well, if it's going to be needed for school fees in the next year to three years, I think possibly five years, uh, with the markets as they are, I think you've probably got to find a high interest bank account to, to generate at least some interest. Don't think you can take the risk of investing in the market because your £20,000 could easily become £10,000 um, quite quickly with the volatility that we're experiencing at the moment. Maybe not, but I just don't think you can 
take the risk there. I think the most important thing is to get it out of the estate um, inheritance tax efficiently. And the example I've just given just means that only £2,000 would be viewed as a potentially exempt transfer, um, which is not going to cause a great deal of worry in terms of inheritance tax. Thanks, James. Um, I've got a question now for, for Knight Frank. Um, I, uh, someone's heard mixed messages about equity release. Uh, is it safe? Thanks, Guy. Um, is it safe? I think that's a very good question. It's one we get asked quite a lot. Um, I believe equity release is safe, but I understand why there are some mixed messages out there. Um, we went through a period um, in, the, in the 90s where certain products were, were launched. Thankfully, those products are no longer available, but they turned out to be uh, fairly poor value uh, for consumers. Um, in the last, uh, where are we, since about 2004, when lifetime mortgages became regulated, um, and especially over the last five to 10 years, we've seen the introduction of um, very high standards under the Equity Release Council. Uh, their focus has always been on consumer protection. Uh, and the FCA updated the, uh, the rules, the regulations around equity release in 2014 as part of their mortgage market review. Uh, so those combination of those two sets of rules and standards uh, mean that equity release is probably one of the, the best protected sets of financial services products today. Um, so yes, I believe it is very safe. And uh, as long as you take advice from a qualified advisor who has to take you through a very detailed process, uh, you should come away knowing all of the pros and cons, knowing all the risks and benefits so that you can make an informed decision. Great, thanks. That's, um, I've got a number of questions about pensions. Um, so I'm going to start with one, one of the simpler ones. They get increasingly complicated. And I think one of the lessons looking at the questions coming in is that everyone's situation is incredibly different. Um, so here I've got, I'm paying uh, my two grandchildren's school fees for my pension income as my son and his wife are not in a position to fund this themselves. I have sufficient pension income to be able to afford that, but I want to make sure that they have enough money to pay for their educations in the event that I die before they complete their education. What are my options? Take that if you like, James. Um, the the most straightforward thing I think there's two, there's two things to uh, to consider here, and I think it depends on on the type of pension that it is. Um, if it's if it's a pension in payment from a final salary where the income's fixed and, and guaranteed, and there's not necessarily a capital sum behind it, which can be passed on, then logically uh, the most straightforward thing to do is potentially to take out some form of life insurance um, and a decreasing term assurance, which is a, a life policy where the uh, where the death benefit comes down at set increments, um, potentially in line with school fees or the remaining outstanding liability, uh, is a very straightforward thing to do if you're in good health. Um, if it's what we refer to as a money purchase pension or a, or a defined contribution pot where that pension is paid from the capital, um, then the most important thing to do is to make sure that, that your pension is in the right place. And what we mean by that is that it's in a contract or a pension wrapper which reflects all of the kind of modern day flexibility that we've seen in, in pension rule changes over the last 15 years or so. Um, you'd need to complete an expression of wishes form um, and they come in, in uh, various shapes and sizes. Uh, but in essence, what that enables you to do is to nominate your grandchildren as individuals to essentially inherit your pension fund, some or all, and they can essentially continue to draw down as you were in the event that you predecease them and they are still at school and they have school fees liabilities. Um, so the key is, is the different type of pension that it is and the flexibility that that, that type of pension affords you. I'd just like to add something to that guy. Dave is absolutely right about the nomination form. Um, it's imperative that any grandchildren who are going to benefit from the pension scheme to pay their school fees are named because if they're not named and the individual who owns the pension dies after age 75, they may only take a lump sum in one go and then tax can apply to that lump sum. If they're named, the pension can sit where it is and they can draw down on it gradually to, 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 to pay the fee, the school fees that they need. Um, and that, that just a simple form with the children, grandchildren's names on um, and the children's names as well, 
the, the, you know, the next generation's names as well, means that the, the full suite of options to draw down or to or take a lump sum if that's what you want are available. You're not just left with the lump sum option, which can again lead to unnecessary tax. So I think a general point you're making, James, is that um, actually documenting what you're doing is incredibly important, isn't it? Absolutely. Whether you're making gifts, whether you're nominating death benefits, um, somebody down the line is going to have to deal with your estate. Um, and, it, you know, it's a hard enough job anyway, uh, quite frankly. Um, the more, more you help them with documenting, doc, 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 documenting what you do, um, it's really, really important. And also the death benefit nomination, you know, you could have a million pound pension fund that suffers £450,000 of unnecessary tax because the individual who needs the money is not named in the document. That, that blows away any good or bad investment performance that you've achieved over the years. It's a, it's a really bad outcome. And just, I'd urge everyone, even if it's not for school fees, just, just review your pensions to make sure that you've nominated, named everybody that you want to benefit from your pension so they get the, all the options that are available. Yeah, I've got an, another question for uh, David Forsdyke. Um, um, you talked about second homes, uh, but what if I have a property that I let out? Uh, that's an interesting one, Guy. Um, this, is a, this is a market that's still very small, but it is emerging. Uh, so the good news is, yes, you can do something with your let property. Um, the equity release definition only really applies to your main residence and uh, potentially your second home. Um, it doesn't apply to property that you let out. So we can't actually call it equity release, but it can look and feel exactly like equity release. It can look and feel exactly like a lifetime mortgage secured against your let property. Um, in fact, there is a, a scenario that we're looking at at the moment for a client who has a, a small portfolio of let property uh, and would like to raise some funds against those uh, to help their, their family. So the good news is, is yes, it is possible. Um, choices are currently a little bit limited because it's quite a new market, uh, but we'd be happy to, to take people through those options. Great, thanks. Um, I've got uh, several questions that have come in uh, about foreign grandparents. So uh, uh, I think Galina's question uh, summarizes uh, most of them actually. Uh, so uh, the, the question she's raised is uh, grandparents who live abroad uh, uh, and would transfer the surplus income gift to grandchildren educated in England, are there anything that you should watch, watch out for when doing that? Uh, and then should such a gift be transferred into the child's bank account? Uh, trying not to increase the parental tax band, the family would have less disposable, disposable income. Does the child have to fill in a tax declaration at the end of the tax year? Sure, I'll take that, Jamie. Um, so the, the, the first part of the question about the grandparents living abroad, um, the, the gift from net excess income rule that we spoke about earlier is, is applicable to UK resident domiciled individuals. So the, the grandparents in that example would need to double check the, the legislation and regulations in, in the country that they're based uh, for tax purposes or the jurisdiction. Um, so there's nothing necessarily there. There isn't, certainly isn't a tax on the recipients in the UK for, for the receipt of that money. Um, as far as, as the gift being transferred to the child's bank account, um, a number of considerations uh, around that. I, th I think in, in reference to the tax band, um, a, a child has exactly the same tax allowances as an adult. So they have a £12,500 personal income tax allowance, a £2,000 dividend allowance and a, and a thousand pound savings interest allowance so certainly the children's allowances could be utilized by by some of those gifts um, and technically they would only really be required to to complete a self-assessment form if their income exceeds those uh those allowances um which unfortunately with the with the pathetically low rates of interest on deposit is, is going to take a, a sizable sum um, but it's it's just worth noting that the revenue it's down to uh, the individual concerned to fill in a tax return, the revenue won't come to, to, to you and say you need to fill one in normally where, where income is only derived from those sources. I've got a follow-up question. Um, um, d d will uh, inheritance tax come into play on gifts from foreign grandparents? Uh, yeah, I mean, by default, it will, it will come into play in the sense that, that 
uh, whoever the agent is, it, it will form part of their estate technically. Um, but it, it, as I say, if, if inheritance tax, uh, if, if you know, if it's fifty thousand pounds and it's given to uh, a child who very sadly passes away, not having used that that money, um, the fifty thousand pounds will form part of their estate for inheritance tax purposes. But it will fall within what we refer to as the nil rate band, which is three hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds taxed at 0%. So effectively, there isn't inheritance tax levied on it. Um, if it goes to adults, and again, one of one of the things um, we touched on last time and, and, uh, and a point we would certainly make at, at some point in the Q&A, um, where gifts of capital are made to individuals, uh, if, if, a, if a grandparent makes a gift to their children, because they don't necessarily want to hand control to, to minors, um, then they've got to be comfortable that 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 the grandparent is making the gift to save inheritance tax, but until that asset has been utilised for school fee planning, i.e. spent, it forms part of their estate, i.e. the, the, the grown-up children's, the parents' estate, for inheritance tax purposes. So there could be, could be implications there. Can, you, can, you, can the panel see the Q&A boxes? Um, yes. Okay, okay. There's one from Richard that is Richard Steele that's quite... Um, was well, quite technical, and I just to make sure I get it right. Um, for any excess capital I don't have to use for four to seven years, would a VCT or EIS investment be a sensible play? I acknowledge the risk that may, may cause a large loss. Uh, for CGT benefits, he's, he's added as a, a further qualification. I literally do not understand a word of this, so you're going to have to translate this. No worries. We, we all have an acronym <laughs> in financial planning, so uh, that, that all helps. Um, so VCT is Venture Capital Trust and EIS is Enterprise Investment Scheme uh, and they come with various uh, tax benefits, either income tax relief, capital gains tax deferral and or inheritance tax benefits. Um, they, are, they are by textbook deemed to be at the, the top of the risk ladder, so to speak. So uh, out of 10, they would be a nine or a 10 by default. Um, and the tax benefits are certainly attractive. The difficulty with, um, you know, if you're comfortable with the level of risks, then, then they're an option. The difficulty is, um, particularly with EIS, that, that these businesses are really, they are effectively startup businesses. So the reason you get in certain circumstances, you can have 90% tax relief on these, on EIS investments. The reason is there is no such thing as the proverbial free lunch. You get 90% tax relief because there's a pretty high risk that, that you won't see all of your capital back. The, equally, the difficulty is the time frame. So most EISs, and particularly with changes I won't bore you with now, in terms of, of what HMRC will approve as being an EIS company uh, in terms of, of the tax relief, they're really looking at five to seven years before the, the, the businesses will exit. So even if you've got spare capital that you don't need for four years, putting it into an EIS and needing it after four years could be a considerable, uh, considerable difficulty. Um, VCTs are essentially pooled versions of slightly more mature EISs. So EIS companies that have, that have survived uh, are, are moving into the second stage of, or third stage of their business plan. Um, and they come with less tax relief. They're more liquid. So technically there's, a, there's what we refer to as a secondary market. So some, there is a market for people buying your VCT shares from you. Um, but again, no guarantee of, 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 uh, no guarantee of getting your capital back. Um, and, and I suppose it comes down to how much risk you're willing to take and, and the, perturb, the proverbial Armageddon of putting your money into something to get 30% tax relief from the VCT, um, only to find that when you need the money, there isn't enough there. And then you've got the implications of that in terms of pulling your children out of school. Thanks, David. Um, so n now quite a, um, um, a human dilemma, I think. Uh, so uh, if you, if, or maybe it isn't. Uh, if, if you're thinking about equity release, will you lose control of your home or be stuck in, in your current property forever? Uh, the good news is, no, you won't. Um, modern equity release products have, have become much more flexible. Um, so with a lifetime mortgage, you are still the owner of your property. Um, the title is still in your name. Um, that means you can still do things to your house um, that you would be able to do in any other circumstance as long as that's acceptable to your mortgage lender. So you know, if you wanted to make changes to it or build an extension or um, anything really, you're, you're still in complete control of your house. Um, 
If you want to move home in the future, then lifetime mortgages are portable. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, we've, we've seen a number of clients who have every intention of moving home in the future. Perhaps they're planning to downsize uh, from a large family home to a, a smaller home um, in five to 10 years time. Uh, and a lifetime mortgage will allow you to do that. Most schemes are uh, portable. Uh, it'll give you some flexibility. You can move some or all of the mortgage from one property to another. Uh, so there's some good news there. Um, will you lose the value of your property? Well, um, when we come to think about school fees planning, majority of customers are going to be borrowing relatively small amounts against the value of their property. So even if they let the interest roll up, the, the debt against that property is still relatively small and the remaining equity is still theirs. So they are still uh, leaving behind potentially uh, a fairly significant sum to their beneficiaries. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's become a very flexible product, to be honest, and we are seeing it being applied in, in all sorts of different circumstances. Uh, I think in terms of school fees planning, it, it often uh, it offers a lot of flexibility without tying people down. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. And, and it's it good to hear, I think. It sounds very different from where it was 20 years ago. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so I've got um, someone's asked, they want to help their daughter pay for school fees, but uh, they're worried that they can't afford it. Um, and they have some cash that they can lend, but we don't know about the tax implications of lending money. I don't know whether that's for them or for, or for, their, or for their child. I'll, I'll take that one, I think, David. Um, essentially, it's really up to um, the, the, the grand, well, parents and, and, the, and, the, and their children to decide between them how they want to structure a loan. Um, it can be interest-free. There's no tax consequences on it for the, um, the recipient. It's just a loan. Um, the main issue, really, I think, is, is that if you make a loan um, and it's repaid down the line, um, it's not going to be effective for inheritance tax, honey. It's going to come back into the estate of the grandparent who's lending the money. And it would be a shame if the intention down the line was to turn that loan into a gift. Um, and, and, and in that scenario, at the point you turn that loan into a gift, the seven-year clock starts then. So you could make a loan. It could be lent for three years and then you turn it into a gift. That's a 10 year window effectively for getting that money out of one's estate. So I would think long and hard about um, how to structure a loan and whether a gift is more appropriate. But if, if, if the money's needed back and then perhaps it isn't an inheritance tax issue, um, it's more about security. Um, I go back to what I've said before. Documentation is very important. Making sure it's clear that it's a loan. If there is interest, um, make sure that it is um, is documented, um, and that way you you know you, there's there's less chance of it all going horribly wrong down the line, um, and, and and that's important. What happens if you do that really sneaky thing and turn a gift into a loan? <laughs> what? That's not allowed. <laughs> I, I can't I can't possibly comment on that. I, I I'm unaware of it that people do to you know people have done that and they've turned that's effectively tax evasion, and we wouldn't condone that. Okay, it's also really horrible <laughs> right okay so uh next one um uh many years ago we set up a discretionary trust and we wondered if we could use this to help with our grandchildren's school fees i understand that there is an offshore bond in the trust and we wondered what are the benefits of this and the tax consequences i think i'll, I'll take that again because i alluded to that in my in my little um, presentation at the beginning um I'll, I'll use a number of 500,000 because it's just an easy number for me to remember. But if you put 500,000 pounds into a offshore bond 10 years ago and you haven't touched it, um, you've effectively got uh, 10 years worth of 5% that have built up, which is 50% of the original sum invested. So you could pull out 250,000 pounds up to 250. You can take less and you, you don't lose the accumulated 5% and use that money to, um, to, to, to help with school fees without any tax consequences. Now, if you do it that immediate tax consequences, that is, if you do it that way, all you're doing is deferring the tax to, to a later point. And 
Perhaps a better way of doing it, I think I mentioned in my presentation that many offshore bonds are segmented. Uh, it can be up to a thousand segments, believe it or not. And you can actually, they're, they're individual, identical individual policies. And you can assign those policies from the trust to a bear trust, which is a, a trust for a, a minor. And by doing that, the tax um, on the amount that's been assigned, the gain on the amount that's been assigned, falls upon the, the grandchild. And David mentioned earlier on um, the allowances, there's a 12,500 personal allowance. There's the £1,000 savings allowance, uh, personal savings allowance, but there's also a £5,000 savings allowance that not everybody qualifies for, but you do in certain circumstances. And certainly a child with no other income would qualify. Gains on offshore bonds are taxed as savings, just like bank interest. So you've effectively got £18,500 of gain per grandchild each year that can be taken out of, a, 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 of an offshore bond in a trust. And I, I go back to what I said earlier on, that might mean that the money went in with no tax, it's grown with no or very little tax, and the money's extracted with no tax. And that's, that's the sort of perfect position really of, a, of using an offshore bond is you, you, don't, you, don't, you need an exit strategy, you need an efficient exit strategy. And assigning, grandparents assigning to grandchildren works really well. Parents can't assign to children in the same way because you run into the parental settlement rules where the parents are taxed on anything over £100 a year. That doesn't work. But grandparents doing this is very, very efficient. And we see offshore bonds used in, the, in this way and for other reasons all the time. It's usually part of a high net worth individuals sort of um, investment portfolio. You probably will see an investment bond in there most of the time um, because of the efficiencies that it offers. Great. Thanks, James. Um, so here's a very different kind of scenario that uh, Simone's asked. Uh, if a grandparent pays the school fees directly to the school, what are the implications of doing that? Who wants to answer that one? <laughs> um, I, it's, it, well, what, what, one thing I would say is, is it, might, it might be the answer if the school is offering um, a very good... Um, discount for prepayment. It might be worth, before going down the road that we've been talking about, to, to find out if, by paying directly to the school, um, there is a, a reasonable discount. It's still, it's still a gift as far as yeah. inheritance tax is concerned. That, that's no different. Um, but it might take away the need for equity release. We're being open and honest here. Um, we, we want parent, grandparents to make the right decisions. If if, if paying directly to the school, particularly at the moment, the schools might want some cash flow, you can get a five or 10% discount, probably a good thing to, to look into, but it doesn't change any, any inheritance tax situation. That's, it's still a gift. It's still the seven years, unless you're using the allowances that I've described. Um, you, if you're not using the allowances for other things, you can probably get a good chunk of that money outside every year uh, immediately outside of inheritance tax and again if it's out of excess income it's it's it's, it's ex excess anyway so i don't see it as a bad thing i think it's something that the grandparents should really look into as part of the overall picture yeah i think i would just add to that i i think actually in terms of, of discussions that we'll often have with with clients who are grandparents and looking to looking to try and keep things as simple as possible actually paying the school fees direct to the school it is arguably the most simple thing in terms of planning. It keeps them totally in control of, of their funds. They're not having to hand over significant sums of money, either into trust or to try and think about uh, the, the inheritance tax aspects. Um, there are, there are, you know, ultimately, I, I think Jamie and I would, would both say financial planning is, a, is, is something of a perfect compromise that, uh, rather than a perfect solution. And a perfect compromise in that instance is the grandparents pay the school fees as and when the, the bills come through dead easy where it doesn't necessarily help the grandparents is where there's a much greater need for inheritance tax planning um so there's there's uh, there's the sort of pros and cons so to speak uh, the way i look at it and this is probably leading into the next presentation um about how you structure earlier in the, in the process how you structure the fees we often say the first two or three years worth of school fees probably should come from cash anyway because you wouldn't put money into an investment on day one and then take money out within the first two or three years so it may be that the prepayment option is the first two or three years of school fees a capital lump sum is put into a trust 
so that years years four and five are funded from the trust and then of course you've started some inheritance tax planning as well as making the original you know the prepayment schools for the first two fees for the first two or three years so it's it all i think all of these options are on the table there's not one right answer here it's about structuring um all the different options to to to, to fit the circumstances that you're in okay a uh, question for david um for Stike. um if i use equity release to pay for school fees what happens if i need funds in the future perhaps to pay for care I and mean, people hear a lot about this about the selling of homes to pay for care what, what, what how does that all tie up um that's a very good question guys so um if you've taken out a lifetime mortgage to uh, to help towards school fees then you are uh, immediately reducing the remaining equity in your property so if uh, if in the future you need to pay for care then you're gonna have a smaller pot of money to to do that from within your property um, however there is a, a sort of an accidental benefit really of having a lifetime mortgage in that the lifetime mortgage lender will take a, a first and only charge against your property uh, and in the event of you moving into long-term care um, that actually prevents anybody else taking a charge against your property uh, and I do I have heard of local authorities and other care providers are wanting to take a charge against property in order to cover the cost of care so in a way a lifetime mortgage uh, gives you a bit of protection uh, but it's it's quite a complicated area um, one of the things that we do uh, with all of our clients is that we have uh, a very open and honest conversation with them about what their future might look like um, and part of that conversation is about what happens if their health deteriorates what happens if they do need care what kind of care would they prefer to have um, welfare clients often talk to me about you know they've, they've got a spare bedrooms and they could afford to have a carer come in and live with them um, Others talk about, well, you know, if I need care, then I'd like to go to this particular type of home or have this particular level of care. Um, so by having those conversations with our clients at the outset, any recommendation we make around the, the equity release is, to, is taking those into account. What we don't want to do is encourage a client to raise a load of money to, to perhaps pay for their uh, grandchildren's school fees today but then leave them with a, a problem later on. So we try and take into account the whole of their remaining life expectancy, how they want that future to pan out so that they've got funds uh, to manage both. Uh, thankfully, most of the clients that we talk about, the school fees bit um, is a relatively small amount compared to the rest of their wealth, the rest of their asset wealth. So on the whole, they feel comfortable. They've got enough left in the pot to cope with the cost of care, to, to cope with perhaps adjustments to the home that they might need to make if, if their health does deteriorate. What about if you, um, if you wanted to avoid paying for care? Uh, would, would, would this be a way of doing that? Uh, well, obviously, if you've raised a debt against your property, um, then you've and you've given that away to pay for school fees, then you've no longer got that financial asset. Uh, so that means you've reduced the, the amount of money available to pay for care. Um, I'm not sure you'd describe equity release as a way of avoiding paying for care though. Um, <laughs> the, the, the cost of care varies quite wildly uh, and the type of care that people want varies quite wildly. Uh, how people go about paying for it, how the, uh, the, the benefits involved in paying for care are calculated, that they will look at your current situation, your current wealth, to work out what, what the state's gonna pay for and what you need to pay for. So I wouldn't describe it as a way of avoiding it, but it needs to be part of the conversation, certainly. Thanks. Um, one last question. Um, uh, we don't have any grandchildren yet, our son is 26 and only recently married. Uh, but he what, would like his future children to go to the same fee-paying school that he did. Can we make tax-free gifts to my son, which he can set aside to cover school fees if he doesn't have children yet? 
I'll take that if you like, Jamie. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the short version is, is absolutely, is, uh, as James mentioned, they, they, they can make the use of the £3,000 uh, annual capital gift exemption uh, and any excess income without uh, inheritance tax considerations. Uh, he can then use that capital tax efficiently to uh, invest himself. So he could use his ISA allowance and build that up over, over the course of time. Um, and then he can draw on those funds if, if and when children come along and, and end up at, at fee paying school. Um, as ever, the grandparents have got to be comfortable that, that you know, they give him potentially £6,000 per tax year for, for the purposes of school fee planning. Um, that's the intention that there's nothing to say that he has to use it for school fee planning. And if it gets to uh, somewhere where Van Aston Martin looks an appealing alternative, he can go and buy the Aston Martin and not use it for school fees, um, which, which has only happened once in my entire career. Um, but there's nothing to say that, that they're, they're stuck with that. Um, and, I, and I think that that highlights, as, as we were saying before, you know, the, the, the importance of having a financial plan for, for, for the grandparents and having certainty of what can be afforded um, and, uh, you know, in a nice way, making sure that grandparents have as much or as little control and, and, and flexibility over what they want those gifts to, to, to be for. Um, as I say, one of, the, one of the dangers of handing over lifetime gifts is that they can end up not being used for the purpose that they were intended. Um, but certainly in answer to the question, absolutely, Six thousand pounds a year between a couple into ISAs and other tax efficient investments is a is a very easy way of doing it. Just to just to add to what David said there, if there is a concern about the Aston Martin purchase, um, that's where a trust comes in. Yeah, you know, gift the six thousand pounds a year to a trust that you're in control of, where it's invested, who gets it and when, and you'll have trustees. So if you pass on, there'll be other people that can carry out your wishes for you, and you can do a nominate you could, like a letter of wishes attached to the trust which sets out your your plans for that money and that's that's what we we tend to recommend to clients when there are issues we, we come across it where the the, the, the parents aren't necessarily uh, able to make financial decisions for example or cannot be trusted to make them um and that's where a trust would come in and would work very well well that was an incredibly helpful session i think um I suspect that lots of you will f feel your heads are reeling slightly because I think running around multiple people's financial situations is just a bit mind boggling. It's like, it's like a sort of epic episode of Money Rocks Live, I think. Um, but, but I hope that everyone found something in there that, that fitted uh, the kind of questions that they've got uh, and need answering. Um, I'm going to be sharing the contact details and presentations with everybody via an email uh, later this afternoon. Uh, and the recording of this will be will also be available. Uh, our next finance session uh, will be in September. But in the meantime, we return to education topics. So our next Parents Forum event is being held with the Good Schools Guide on Wednesday the 15th of July in the morning again. And it addresses a very timely question indeed for parents whose children are returning to or starting boarding school in September. Starting at boarding school is always a big event. And the transition after extended lockdown raises lots of challenges. So this event is designed to help British and international families uh, prepare their children for this return. Uh, it'll also cover how schools are handling admissions in this current situation. So uh, with that, a big thank you, and uh, I'll see you in September.